Uh, OK, so I'll talk today about uh, private information retrieval. Uh, so I know many of you know all about it, and maybe some of you don't know anything about it. So I'll assume the later. OK, so I'll, I'll introduce everything from, from scratch. And I'd like to say this is joint work with my students. Uh, well, this uh, Eitan Jacobi actually is no longer a student. He's a uh, faculty at the Technion. Uh, but these are my current student, Arman Fazeli and Sankir Srao. And then we had some discussions with, with many other people as well. All right, so I'll say, uh, I said I, I won't assume anything, any knowledge about private information retrieval. So let's explain uh, the sort of the general problem, the general setting. Uh, so we have a database which stores some information, and we model this as one long string, uh, which could be binary or non-binary. In this talk, we'll assume the binary model, okay? And there is a user, and the user wants one item from this database, okay? So x sub i. Uh, and the thing is, the user does not want to reveal to the server which item the user wants, okay? So that's the privacy. And formally, uh, this condition could be phrased like that. So the user will send queries to the server. These queries will be randomized. Uh, there are some random coins that the user flips. And we require that the distribution of these queries uh, does not depend on the index i. OK? Uh, so is it at all possible? I mean, those people that haven't seen it, uh, how do you get x sub i without telling the server what i is? Well, it's certainly possible there is a, a trivial solution. You could ask for the whole thing. Okay, so you read the whole thing, uh, this whole database. The, user know, the, database, the server knows nothing, and you retrieve your ice item. Now, that's obviously not very efficient because we assume this n is very, very large. Uh, so this is the naive solution. Unfortunately, in this paper, this is the paper that introduced this whole problem and set it up uh, some 20, what is it, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, 95 at Fox. Uh, so in that same paper, they showed this is the only solution. Okay, so in fact, if you want to achieve this privacy, then you have to communicate in this setting, as shown here, uh, the number of bits that you have to communicate between the user and the server is going to be proportional in it. Okay, uh, so that's bad, and we don't want to accept that. So indeed, there are alternative solutions. Okay, and there are of two types. Okay, two general types. This one actually came first in this original paper by Shor, Kushilevitz, uh, Goldreich, and Sudan. But later on, uh, uh, there was introduced a notion of computational PIR. Okay, so we replace this information theoretic privacy condition by computational assumptions, okay? Certain problems. The first one they used was quadratic residuosity. Uh, there's some one-way function solutions. And so the security is based, as we would in conventional crypto, on hardness of computation. In information theoretic PIR, which attracted actually most of the research, I'm not sure why exactly, but somehow most of the papers treat this stronger model we require information theoretic security uh, as before. And in this case, we achieve it by replicating the database among several non-communicating servers, okay? And uh, by that result that I showed on the first slide, we need at least two non-communicating servers in order to make information uh, theoretic PIR possible, okay? And in this talk, it will be entirely about information theoretic by uh, private information retrieval. We're not going to consider the computational model uh, at all. Okay? So, uh, all right, let me give you an example of uh, how this might work. So, how we might achieve with non communicating servers uh, information theoretic privacy uh, without downloading the whole database. Okay? And I'll do it on the board. Uh, so the example I'll give is maybe the simplest one to describe. Uh, it's not at all a good example. I mean, it's, it's terribly inefficient. But uh, just, just to give you an idea of how it might work, was downloading less than linear 
in n number of bits. Okay? So this is due to the original paper by Shor, Kushilevitz, Goldreich, and Sudan in 95. And uh, the setting is uh, like this. So uh, we'll replicate replication among four servers. So the number of servers will be always denoted by k in the stock. So k servers. And uh, the, complex the communication complexity, the number of bits that are communicated between Alice and the four databases, in this case, is going to be eight times, exactly eight times, square root of n plus four bits. This is pretty awful. Okay, so it's much better, of course, the linear n, but by today's standards, we can do much, much less than square root of n number of bits, but let's just show an example. Uh, so uh, in this case, we arrange the database as a square. So something like square root of n by square root of n bits. And let's assume that we want some bit, let's call it x sub s sub t, where those indices s and t, they range from 1 to square root of n. Okay, so, uh, so Alice, the user, wants x s t, and she will generate two vectors, let's call them y and z, and they are from their binary vectors of length square root of n, and she generates them uniformly at random. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. This is sometimes used in crypto. This means take, this is distributed, sampled uniformly at random from, from that set. Okay? Uh, so, all right, so what are the queries? What, what will Alice send to the servers? So there's four servers. And the first one will just get, so maybe I should write uniformly random. The first one will get just y and z. And the second server will get something very similar, except we take y and we flip the s bit in i. So s is the row index of the bit that we're going to want to read. I'm denoting by e sub s the unit vector was 1 in the position s and zeros everywhere else. So basically, this means we just flip the corresponding bit of y. Okay? And z. And maybe you can see how it will go. So s3 will get the bit flipped in the other position, c plus, now we flip bit t, and the last one will have both bits flipped, y plus es, z plus et. Okay, so these are the four queries, and you could see that they reveal absolutely no information about anything at all, each one of them individually, each one of them is uniformly random. If you take a uniform vector, flip a bit, it's still uniformly random all over the set. Okay? So, all right, so what, do <coughs> what does the database do? So the answers. Uh, that's very easy. So basically, here's a database and a server, some server, one of these, they all will do exactly the same thing. So given a query, let's call it uv, uh, return the following. So let me maybe explain. So I'll put the vector u here on the rows and the vector v on the column. Let me maybe write it first. So we'll return one bit, which is the answer bit, and it's like that. So I'll sum over the support of u and 
the support of V x i j. Okay, so what does it mean? So uh, let me show a picture. Okay, so say these bits in U are 1, the rest is 0. These bits in V are 1, the rest is 0. So it's the sum, mod 2 of course, everything is in the field of those bits that are at those intersections. So that's clear? Okay, so that's that. So what is, what about, okay, so now, So this is a unit vector, we'll use that notation later on, uh, that has one in position S. Okay? Is this clear? So basically the effect of this is flipping bit number S in uh, Y. Okay? Unit vector, yeah. Uh, okay, so reconstruction. Now Alice will receive four of those bits. How will she read the bit that she wants to read. Uh, very simple, so reconstruction. Okay, so let me draw four squares here like this. Okay, so A1 that is the answer from server one, has nothing flipped. Uh, A2 has the S, row, row S flipped. A3 has column T flipped. And A4 has both of them flipped. Okay, so let's see. So what about the bit that we want to read? Read. How many times, oh, let's say four. So these are four sums. How many times does it appear uh, in one of these four? Well, so this is at this position. Okay, so suppose the originally in Y and Z, uh, the S and T were zero. So it's not here, it's not here, because T is still zero, it's not here, but it's here. If the other way around, so the only one it will appear in is A1. And so, so there are four, this position, this position goes through all the four variations on it exactly once. Okay, so contributes uh, exactly once to uh, exactly one answer. Okay, what about other bits? So all other bits contribute an even, that's important, number of times. Okay, so maybe uh, you need to do a case analysis. Suppose I have a bit and uh, at some position ij, and this ij was originally zero in both y and z. Okay, and it's, it's not in row S, it's not in column T either. So it will be always off, zero times. If it's not in row S or column T, it will appear either zero or four times. Either it's always on or it's always off. If it is in row S or column T, it will appear either zero or two times. It's kind of easy to see. So then that's it. So uh, good, so if you believe one and two, then the bit, the bit that we want to retrieve is just the sum modulo two of the answers. Yeah.
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted I wanted it to be kind of clear with pictures. Of course, it's very easy. Could could be easily. Okay, is this clear? So, very simple example. And what we observe is that there is, uh, you know, the step of query generation, the step of computing the answers, and the step of reconstruction. Okay, good. Let's go on. So, uh, again, 20 years have passed since this example, and there's been a lot of progress. In fact, in the original paper, much better complexity was already shown if we use K servers in general. Uh, oh, sorry, so this is for two servers, we can do one third. For K servers in general, in the original paper, we could do this complexity, so much better than the square root. Uh, then a couple of years later, this exponent of n was reduced to 1 over 2k by Ambainis. And after that, about every five years, uh, there was a major breakthrough in, in, this, in this research. Uh, the first one is due to two people that are here, so Amos Bemel and Yuval Ishai, they're both in the audience. Uh, so this is polynomial in K, uh, and this is, this, is, this is better than that. Okay, so those are, this, this is 2K, and this is better than that. Okay? Now there was a major result by Hanin, which reduced the complexity to something like this. This was assuming that there's infinitely many Mersenne primes, but that condition was removed later on by Efremenko. Uh, the important difference between this and this, we'll think of the number of servers as a constant. Okay, so this is n to some constant. This is n to a function that goes to zero as n grows. Okay? And unfortunately, you needed at least three servers for that to work. That did not work. Yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, Ihanin, if you had infinitely many Mersenne pro, it was a little bit worse. But maybe I should. I, I was actually, when I was preparing the slides, I was wondering whether I should put here both Ihanin and Ephraimenko. Uh, the major breakthrough was, was Ihanin, in my mind. But, OK. Uh, all right. And then recently, there came out a paper, very nice paper, by Dvir and Gapi which gives the same complexity as before, but now with only two servers. Okay? And uh, this is a note here, which will be important for us later on. So I didn't write it down, but the complexity could be made even lower for this algorithm if you take more than two servers. Okay? Uh, all right, so this is communication complexity, but then there is another important parameter that really should not be ignored, and that is the storage overhead. How many bits do we store all together? So uh, for those of you that work in coding, this would be one over the rate. We use it, we call it the rate of a code. Here it's usually the other ratio. So it's just the, throughout this talk will be the total number of bits stored on all the servers divided by the number of bits in the database, okay? And indeed, this paper reduced the storage. So what is the storage overhead for a k-server PIR? It's trivially uh, just k. We replicate the database k times. And so this paper in particular reduces the storage overhead from a factor of three, at least, to a factor of two, which is much better, okay? Uh, now, the question, when I looked at that uh, a couple of years ago, should we be happy with uh, k equal 2? So I, I'm doing coding theory for my, my research, and k equal 2 is rate 1 half. And if somebody were to tell me you can never have a code of rate higher than 1 half, I would be very sad. I mean, most, most in coding theory, we don't like such codes, okay? In PIR, uh, that's, that's the state of the art, okay? So I'm not happy, and I don't think anybody should be happy with storage overhead, too. Uh, but hey, uh, this is the best possible. And we just show that with one server, you, you have to have linear communication complexity. And so that's the dilemma. You know, what, what is it that, what can you do? 
Okay, so this is what this talk is about. Okay, so uh, right. So even though it is impossible, uh, let us ask this question. So can we still achieve efficient uh, private information retrieval in uh, information theoretic sense, but we don't want to double the number of bits. Uh, it's too much. Okay? This is not a new idea. People considered solving impossible problems before. So the first talk I uh, heard on crypto was by Boaz Barak, and that's an actual quote from that talk. So, um, okay. So, all right, now more, more, more seriously, uh, Here's what, so let, let's let you give you, so we, we, we can do this, okay? Otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you some idea of how we do it, okay? We'll see all the details very soon. So we take uh, motivation from distributed storage, okay? So in fact, in practice, this database is gonna be very large. It's likely no single server might even fit the whole database. Maybe you have to store it in parts anyway, okay? Uh, and so this is sort of the underlying idea, okay? We'll take this database string and we'll partition it into several parts and then we'll now encode them in some way. We'll use many servers, not too many, but more than K. Uh, and then we'll do it in such a way that in the end, so every server will serve only a small part, you know, some part of the database, and the total number of bits that we store on all of them is going to be small. You, know, you, have, to, you have to have at least n, it will be n times one plus epsilon. Okay, so we'll see uh, how it is, uh, how it works. Shortly in a couple of slides, we'll see an example of how you can do that. Uh, but I, first I need some definitions because in the example I will be using some notation. So normally people define formally a uh, K-server PIR protocol. We need a little bit more. So we'll have a concept of a scheme which has all the things around the protocol. So there is the database, uh, NBID binary string, there are K non-communicating servers, there is the user Alice, and then there is the protocol, which is basically this algorithm of this kind that makes this happen. And the protocol is really not one algorithm, but three algorithms. We give names to each of them. There is the query generation algorithm, Q. We'll, we'll use them in our scheme in a generic way. Then it generates queries. These are sent to servers. The servers use an answer algorithm, A. Uh, to return the answers, and then there's the reconstruction algorithm that the Alice, the Alice would use to retrieve the bit, okay? And a specific example of that is, is on the board. Okay, we'll just use this notation. Uh, that is almost all I need. I need just one more definition uh, that, that is coming here. Uh, the reason I need it is like this. So our scheme, we'll, we'll construct a coding scheme that sits on top of a PIR protocol. And that coding scheme requires two things. First, a binary linear code that we'll talk a lot about such codes, we'll define them shortly. But in addition, it needs an existing, I'm not gonna invent new PIR protocols. I'm gonna take this as, this su subject has been studied for 20 years, hundreds of papers, extremely efficient stuff. I'm gonna take existing PIR protocol, which one, anyone, but with this property, it has to be linear, okay? So what does I mean, what I mean exactly by linearity? Uh, this is answer linearity, okay? And that's, that notion apparently has been around in the literature. So what I want is this, so the answer algorithm if I give the answer algorithm any query, any fixed query Q, and then somehow I have a database string which is a sum of two things, so then it can be split into, linear. it's linear, okay? Sum of x1 and x2, okay? Now, good, so our result is restricted to such PIR protocols, protocols that are linear. So then the question is, well, which PIR protocols out there are linear? There's very good news, all of them are, 
Okay, so in fact, I couldn't find any, so I looked at all the protocols I could find uh, in the literature, couldn't find a single example of a nonlinear PIR protocol. I spoke with Amos and Yuval yesterday. They said maybe David Woodruff has a nonlinear example. I'm not sure. The, the only ones I know of uh, so far, they're all linear. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But it's nice that our scheme is generic. So, yeah, I mean, say I'll take Virgopi if I really want to do it because that's the best one. Yes? So, so I just want to make sure I understand what's your money product. Are you multiplying on the stored data? We'll see an example on the very next slide. Okay, so I think it will, it will answer this question. Okay, one more thing which is sort of a tacit assumption in PIR, and that is that. The, this answer algorithm A is public knowledge. Everybody knows it. And so in particular, all the servers know it. So if, so in this example here, all four servers do the same thing. But we don't, in fact, most PIR protocols are like that. But we don't assume that to be necessarily true. We don't require that. What we do require is, well, if the, in the original protocol, one server does one thing, the other is supposed to do another thing. They all should be able to do everybody else's job, if so required. Okay, so that's a small point. Okay, good. Let's see an example. So what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to take any linear existing three-server PIR protocol. This one has storage overhead three. And we're going to reduce it to two. Okay, this M and S will become clear in a second what they are, okay? So how shall we do this? This is it. This is the whole thing. We'll partition the database into four parts. And then uh, what do people normally do? They replicate. Well, we, we're not going to replicate. We're going to code. Okay, so we'll use eight servers. Uh, the first four of them will just store the four parts, and the other four will s store some you know, linear combinations of the parts. Okay, that's it. That's the whole scheme. So just some notation. I call so this results in something I call a coded PIR scheme with S equal four parts and M equal eight coded shares, which is equal also to the number of servers, and that's this M over S over here. This notation will be consistent throughout the talk. All right, so one thing is clear. Now I have to show what am I going to do with it, how is the PIR going to work, but one thing is already very clear. If this is what I store, what is my storage overhead? Okay, and in general, so this S and M will be throughout the whole talk. So I'll partition the database into S parts. Each of them will have N over S bits. So I'll store, I'll use M servers, each storing N over S bits, normalized by the size of the database, the storage overhead is M over S. Okay, very, very simple. Okay, now I have to show how it works, okay? Uh, all right, so this is what I stored. Now suppose I want to read, I want to retrieve privately a bit. And so there are four different parts and we're going to do different things for different parts. Let's assume for now that we want to read from the first part of the database. Okay, x1. So what I'll do, I'll take my existing query algorithm of the whatever, so I'm going to emulate an existing protocol, Virgopi if you want, anything. Okay? And generate three queries. I need eight queries because I have eight servers, but I'm emulating this protocol. Whatever queries it gives me, that's fine. Uh, and then I'm going to send the queries to the servers like that. So some queries are replicated. Okay? Now uh, I'm going to get back the answers. And they're determined again. So I'm, I'm, I'm running on top of an existing PIR protocol. So the servers do whatever the answer algorithm of that P requires them to do and they return the answers. And I'm going to ignore three of them, use five of them. can ignore. Now, I guess the privacy is clear, so these are, let's think of these queues as just being uniformly random. I haven't, you know, I inherit the privacy from the original algorithm. And here are the answers that I get. 
Three of them are exactly as before. Two of them are coded. Okay, they're, they're, they're linear combinations uh, as, as I stored. Okay, good. So that's the information that I have. Now I'm going to crucially use the linearity. So let's see. So I can do this. I'll take A2 and A5. Why do I do that? They both contain, no, well, they contain X1, but both of them contain X2, so I'm going to add them up. Okay, by linearity, the contribution of X2 is just going to cancel out. Okay, similarly, I'm going to take these two, add them up, it will cancel out. Okay, so what I have now, I have A1 and these two. And I'm going to just take these three answers and plug them as is into the original reconstruction algorithm of P. But what are these answers? If I look at them, so A1 is exactly what P would have answered on a database of size n over 4. A prime 2 is exactly what I would have gotten, uh, here it is, uh, from the second query on, on that same part and so on. So if I just plug them in into C, uh, I get back, you know, a because P, the, 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 the protocol I'm emulating is correct, it's happy now. Is this clear? Okay. Well, great. So this works for the first part of the database, but that's not enough. Well, what about the second part? It works in exactly the same way. So I'll generate three queries as before. I'll send them to servers. As, we'll, we'll see a general rule for that. In a second, I'll get again. I'll ignore five ans. I'll ignore three answers. Use five, uh, and then I'm going to add up the queries. Magically, things cancel out. I'm left again with what I want to have. Okay, so the answer to the first query uh, for the second part. Now, the answer to the second query, the answer to the third query. I plug them in. Everything works out. Okay. Uh, good. All right. So what I want to do now is to generalize from this. Ex yes. Very good. Yeah, we, we, we address that. But this is quite complicated. Okay. There is a good answer, and I have a slight reference. If you allow me, I will not touch on it in this talk. I'd be happy to explain it to you. Because it'll take some good 10 minutes. No, maybe not. But I don't want to make it too complicated. OK. Uh, it, it works. Uh, OK, so let's, let's, let's introduce a general definition now. It's going to follow us throughout this talk. So now I'm going to talk about coded K-server PIR schemes with S parts and M shares. And the formal definition is similar to we're not changing sort of conventional notions of PIR. So I have a database now partitioned into S parts. I have M coded shares, each of them of the same length, N over S. They're all linear functions of the database, a user as before. And I'm going to talk about a coded PIR protocol which emulates a conventional, a normal PIR protocol, how in a way that we have just seen in this example, and this notion can be formally defined. I'm not going to do it. We'll see maybe in a proof of a theorem, we'll see a more formal uh, way of emulation. Okay? So good. So now with this, what about the storage overhead? Well, good news. Uh, this is easy which is so an example, there's nothing to prove here, it's trivial. The storage overhead of such a thing, as we saw in the example, is just M over S. So if I can construct such a coded PIR scheme with S parts M shares, I know the storage overhead. Yes? So here, I mean, maybe it almost looks like what you did, you just composed them two PIRs, Yeah, yeah that, that's also a reason why I presented this particular example. So things nicely cancel out. It's not exactly that. Uh, it's, it's actually quite different. Uh, we'll see why shortly. Uh, yeah, there is this ni nice property of things does do, canceling out nicely, but 
exactly why we'll see. Okay? Good, so let's summarize. So what, are, what do we have now? We have a general definition of coded PIR. This is the main topic of this talk. And we have seen an example that conforms to that definition. That begs a question, uh, well, what, are, what is going on? I mean, we have one example. Does it exist in general? So in fact, there are several questions to answer. So first, I showed you some magic, things were nice, things canceled out. Why does it actually work? Uh, okay, we want to understand that. Uh, more seriously, okay, so we have now three parameters. You know, M servers, S parts, K is the K server of the original protocol will determine our communication uh, complexity. So we want to know for which values of M, S, and K do such things exist. What about communication complexity? I mean, that is the main parameter. I haven't really addressed that at all, okay? And of course, the main question for this talk, we're focusing on storage overhead. It is M over S, so how low can we actually make this ratio, which is similar to this question, but that's with more emphasis on storage overhead. And we'll answer all of these questions. And to do that, let's look again add the example and try to understand why it is that things actually do work out, okay? So, all right, so let's look at the example again. So this is our coding scheme, okay? This is what we did, how we computed the coded shares from the parts. And let's just rewrite these equations in terms of a matrix. This will be a generator matrix of a code. I like codes, I think, want to think of it this way, all right? So, okay, so what is special about this generator matrix? Which properties of this coding scheme make it work? And turns out there are two properties that we need. Well, one of them is here. So first of all, if you kind of invert, so now you want to go back in the reconstruction, you want to get the part back from the shares. And we want to be able to do it in three different ways. Okay, so for each part, there are three sort of recovery equations that are determined by this matrix, okay? Moreover, these three equations in each of the four cases, they're disjoint. No coded share appears, let's say, here and also somewhere here. Okay, they, they all appear at most once. Some of them don't appear at all, that's okay. All right, so these are the properties. And that is, okay, I'm telling you, this is what makes it work. Uh, so, okay, so this, I want to now formalize it in terms of a definition. There are many equivalent ways to define what I just said. And this, to me, is the neatest way. Uh, and this is in terms of a matrix. So we'll say that a matrix has property P sub K uh, if the following happens, for every i, I can find k disjoint subsets of columns of this matrix that add up to the unit vector e sub i, was the i in that position. We'll see an example of that shortly. And, okay, so I'll call it property p sub k, and also I'll say that this is a k-server PIR matrix. Well, let's see an example. This is the matrix we have just seen on the previous slide. So what about E1? Okay, we want to construct that unit vector. There's three disjoint, well, first of all, it appears itself. It's a systematic matrix. And then this pair of columns, if you add them up, gives you E1. This blue pair of columns gives you E1 as well. They're disjoint. Okay, and E2, same thing. It appears there is one pair and another pair that, that gives it. Notice the total number is five. So each column is, is a server, and we used answers from five servers. We ignored the others. Which ones? The ones that are not here, okay? And uh, E3, E4, all of them work out. Okay, so that is the property that we need. And okay, so we could talk about matrices or we could talk about codes. Uh, sometimes it's more convenient to talk about codes. So we'll say that a code is a, uh, K server PIR code if there exists a generator matrix for 
C with this property P sub K. Alex, are you yes. With the of it's really yes, it's very similar. It's not exactly. So in fact, we just submitted with Eitan Yakobi a paper, which so this is a weaker notion than batch codes. And what we do in that paper, we give a very so, so now we have very good constructions for these PIR codes, and we now use these to construct batch codes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mentioned batch codes later in the talk, not in detail, just because I don't have time for everything. But yeah, very similar. Yes. Weaker. It's just, so for batch codes, you want any multiset. Here, this multiset that you want is just one element repeated k times. That's, that's, that's the difference. It's not exactly the same. Oh my god. Ten minutes? Ah! All right, so goodness, uh, we won't be able to see half of this talk. Sorry, but I never gave it before, so it took too long. All right, well, what are we going to do? So this property that we just defined, um, it really is equivalent to having what I just said before. K does joint recovery sets uh, for, for each position. Okay, I wanted to include proofs in this talk because all the proofs are quite easy. Maybe I won't have time, so easy, just, just verify it. Okay, I'm going to skip through, through the proof. It's, it's very, very easy. Uh, okay. Uh, good. So theorem. Uh, ten minutes. Huh? Um, okay, this is it. So if we have a K-server PIR code and a K-server linear uh, PIR protocol, anyone, because they're all linear, then we can always combine them together, as we did in this example, and produce the corresponding coded PIR scheme. And again, this is the formal proof. The encoding is like that, was this K-server PIR matrix. And again, if I have 10 minutes, I probably will not uh, go through it. But it's, it works just as in the example. OK, OK, yeah, we'll see. There's lots of stuff to go on. Uh, so uh, it just works, it's, it's, it's a formalization and extension of what we have seen already in some detail in the example. Maybe I should talk in general about the queries. There was a little bit of magic. So now, how do I set up the queries? So I have K of them generated by the protocol I'm emulating. What I'm going to do is to find, all right, first, and I'm gonna, I want to read from the else part of the database, let's say. So I'm going to find the k joint recovery sets that exist. And uh, this is what I'm going to do. So uh, OK, so I have uh, uh, some j. So I want to send a query to server number j. Okay? So I'll find the unique t in here. If, if j is not in the union of the recovery sets, I don't care what I send to the server. I'm going to ignore the answer. Uh, that I receive from it anyway, so I could just send a uniformly random string, whatever. Those that are here, I'm going to find the unique subset T that, that is joint. Okay, so there is a unique subset T in this from 1 to K, which contains that J, and so I'm going to send the T skewery to that server. Okay, that's maybe a little bit difficulty. So, okay, and that's an important notice. Um, the privacy is preserved. Okay, so we're sending the same queries as before, just in a shuffled order, and so we inherit the privacy. Okay, after that, it works exactly as before. Things cancel out by linearity. So here we use the linearity of the PIR protocol to get from this sum, we bring the sum inside by linearity. Okay, and so we have this, but this, by the disjoint recovery property, is exactly XL. And so we're done. And we do it for each of these sets, and we're done, and we reconstruct. Uh, communication cost, that's important. Well, you kind of see we increase it, but not by much, OK? So formally, uh, all right, let this be the number of bits that I upload. This is the number of bits that I download. So here is the statement. So let's forget about this for a second. Uh, so, OK, so then with that, I can give you a proof. All right, what happens? Uh, we take some existing protocol P. And instead of sending K queries, we're sending M queries, where M is greater than K. So we're increasing by a factor M over K, which is going to be small, 3, you know, 
five. It's constant, constant factor is usually not a big deal. Uh, not quite. I mean, the queries themselves, the answers themselves are a little bit shorter because they actually work on a shorter database, to be fair. This is something that, uh, that is the answer to your question, okay? Uh, which I'm not going to elaborate on. Uh, but we need to send a random permutation of the indices to the databases. Uh, okay, let's go on. All right, so, okay, so what do we have so far? Uh, we have shown this. Give me a K-server PIR code uh, and a K-server PIR protocol. If it's linear, we have our coded scheme. Okay? Uh, well, uh, okay, but we still have other questions to, to consider, okay? We had four of them. Well, we answered two. Okay, we just talked about communication complexity. Hopefully, we understand by now the, the example. Okay? We still have not answered these two questions, which are the main questions. Okay? So, in order to answer the, and, and in particular, you know, this is what I want to focus on. This is the main question for this talk. Uh, all right, so, all right, to do this, it all depends. So, the, the parameters M, S, and K, they're all determined by this underlying PIR code. So, let me introduce these two functions. That's where most of the work in our paper goes on. The shortest lengths of a PIR code and the smallest redundancy. And the storage overhead is just determined like that. Okay, and we notice we reduced now a PIR problem. We can forget about PIR from this point. We have a coding theory problem, like just like that. Okay? Uh, so trivial solution of case two. Okay, just take a single parity code. Why does that work? Well, we add one bit, and then for each bit we have two recovery sets. This join the bit itself and the rest of them. They add up. Okay, so trivial for two servers. And from there, we can already state this theorem. So this goes very fast. So you normalize it by S. So, you know, S plus 1 over S goes to 0 quite fast as S as, as grows. Okay, so we have that. So we can take a two server view GOPI. Uh, so we'll get this complexity, and, and that's it. Okay, very simple. Uh, okay, so, goodness, I have too much. Maybe I should stop here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, why, why not stop here? Because actually, FK, as k grows, uh, we have much better complexity. That's one good reason. Much better communication complexity. So, want to do it. This was a solution, trivial solution, for k equal 2. Uh, the other reason is the problem itself, the coding problem, becomes really interesting for k at least three, and there are connections to lots of different topics, encoding theory, combinatorics, what want you. So, yeah, multi-set batch codes, you've all are also uh, here mentioned. Uh, okay, so I was planning to show you connections to these four. I don't know if I should. Uh, okay, so there is a construction. Maybe I should show you one of them. Uh, Okay, so this already shows that for all k, not only two, this is a hypercube or a cubic construction. I think also was used in the case of batch codes in a different context. Uh, anyway, this shows that for all k, not only k equal two, we can achieve a storage overhead going to, to zero. Uh, but the redundancy of that construction is not very good. Maybe, oh, majority logic codes. I was planning to do it on the board. That has been studied in the 70s in coding theory. Their special type of codes was very fast linear time decoding. This is exactly what we need now. So, you know, you can open up old papers, books, that, that, that they have this property that we need, all of them. Okay, so I'm not going to explain. Uh, should I explain this? Uh, right, so this is, uh, do I have? Five minutes, if I can. All right, so we'll construct uh, those PIR codes from certain set systems with two properties that mirror the properties of PIR codes. So we take just a set of subsets of the integers from 1 to S. We say that it's a K cover if every 
element here belongs to at least k of them. And we want them not to be almost disjoint. So if they intersect, any two of them, if they, either they do not intersect at all, or if they intersect, they intersect in one element. Okay, that's what we need. If those familiar with linear hypergraphs, how many are? The, these are linear hypergraphs uh, of vertex degree at least k. It's the same thing. Uh, okay, but now suppose we have such a collection, then we can use them as parity checks in the PIR code. Okay, and it's not difficult to see that if you do that, you get your k disjoint recovery sets uh, for each information bit, just from these two properties. Okay, uh, good. So now the question is, all right, so that's a corollary. If we can only get this, we get our codes, we get the code, we get the coded PIR scheme. Okay, so the question is, where do we get them from? Well, the answer is plenty. You know, there is combinatorics. So, last slide, okay, I'm just going to explain it. Steiner systems is the first thing that comes to mind. It's the definition of a Steiner system. This is an example of a Steiner system. Blocks, there are points, there are blocks, and every pair of points is contained in a unique block. Do you recognize this? Some do, some don't. Now, probably many of you do. Uh, okay, so it's just a fan of plane. All right, much better. Uh, okay, so now, good, so there's that many block. Any point is contained in that many of them, and these blocks are almost disjoint by, you can see, okay, it's easy to see. So if we just take the blocks of a Steiner system, we can take them as this disjo almost disjoint K cover. We can do that. And the results are extremely disappointing. So uh, if we do that, uh, okay, this is the equation. There's something known as Fisher inequality, and this is what we get. We get that the redundancy is at, at, you know, the best you can get from Steiner systems this way is this, and that means storage overhead at least two, which is not what we want. Okay, so we have to be a little bit more clever. So we'll define things in a different way. Same Steiner system, but now the block, the points, will be the blocks. Okay, that. We just turn it around, and then it works. So this is going to be my disjoint K cover. So, and I'm going to partition the set of blocks. So every block is now contained in Q of them, because that's how many points it contains. Okay, so we can do this, and then by Wilson theorem, we get this. And that is optimal. Okay, so I have more slides, more constructions that show from bipartite graphs, and we get the same thing. So the redundancy of PIR codes, the rate goes to one. So we've seen this already, that's easy enough. The redundancy is much more interesting and we now know the optimal redundancy. It scales as the square root of S. So we know exactly the redundancy now, it's not on the slides, for K equal two, three, and four, we can give you a formula. Okay, exactly, it's a simple formula. K equal five, it's still open. Okay, so it's asymptotically like that, but exactly we don't know. Uh, okay, so constant weight, oh, tables. So yeah, we compile tables. Uh, so this is a research problem, okay? Uh, yeah, you're welcome to try. So it's just, you know, sort of new problem. Similar to batch, but quite different actually. Uh, and this is the storage overhead that we get. So if we look at the top row, this is conventional PIR. This is with one part. So you can see this is where we start, and this is where this is kind of very practical. 24 parts at most. You know, we have longer tables, but you know, so quite fast we can we can reduce the storage overhead dramatically. Okay, that's it. Sorry for running over time. So thank you. <laughs>